All right, here comes our guest, y'all. Okay, okay, all right. <sighs> Sean, well, today I get into a little bit of trouble with you guys. I apologize. I know uh -huh. that you hate it when I bring an academic on or a scientist, uh, big brains in general, but this guy seems to None of really <laughs> just hold on. He seems to really be liked by those who have taken his class. All right. He's been teaching filmmaking for almost 30 years now and out of some of the top institutions in town. He's taught his students mostly through doing in that he's managed to gather the funds necessary to himself make nine films on subjects as odd as a single digit, uh, nighttime mucus, party drinks, hemophilia, major golf tournament, addiction, wow. haunted textiles, and Italian wow. candy. And if you can Ooh. believe it, these films have yielded him 11 Academy Award nominations. What? Most wow. importantly, though, he's got four kids, a house in the valley, and married to the coolest woman we three know. Gang? It's Paul Thomas Anderson. No. no. Yes. Oh, my yeah. gosh. Yeah. Hello. Oh, my gosh. Hi, guys. It's so good to see you. Did you guys have a guest with that list of uh, of subject matters? You really had me reeling on that. Did man. I bury it good? Uh, yeah. That's a great intro. Huh? I worked Paul, on that Paul, for a full you, nine minutes this morning. Paul would, <laughs> Paul, would you have been able to guess yourself <laughs> with that intro? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, now, now let's let's guess it. So a single digit, wh which one is that, man? Well, I did it in order. A single digit, obviously, is heart eight. Heart Night, eight, yeah. Nighttime mucus? Nighttime mucus. Come on. Mm -hmm. Boogie nights, y'all. Party oh, drinks. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Okay. Sorry. Party yeah. drinks. We've got punch drunk love, hemophilia, right. there will be blood. Major right. golf oh, tournament, yeah. obviously the master. Yeah. <laughs> Addiction is inherent vice. Haunted textiles. We know and love Phantom Thread and Italian candy out in theaters now. Oh, wow. The you Valley really Famous your... Licorice Pizza, uh, pizza. record store. That's wow. incredible. All right. All Pretty right. good. I'm so proud of myself, Paul. Can you, you can <laughs> see I'm just beaming. <laughs> he's so, he's so... Guys, we can't do early morning records. I'm that's still like the, up That's from like last the USA night. Today crossword version. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? That oh, was... man. Wait, but Oscar Levant is one of my heroes. Really? Oh, really? Oh, you go. You two, you two He's go. amazing, isn't he? Yes. You know, there's a great Oscar Levant show that he did that was here yeah. on KTLA Channel 5, and Fred Astaire was one of the... That's exactly right. It was impossible to find forever and ever and ever. I have the whole thing if you want it. No, well, here, here but I remember... It was this impossible to find thing, and then um, when this thing YouTube came around, I Heard remember thinking... I'll see if this thing can really find something I want. And I put in the Oscar <laughs> Levant show, and there it was. I said, oh, my God, I'm, I like YouTube. It was there. there yeah, it was. Great. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Dear Mr. YouTube, great job. <laughs> um, what's your, uh, uh, while, while I'm thinking of it, because my brain doesn't hold stuff well, um, the first shot in Magnolia, was that oh when, when, when you go through the hallways and you go onto the sound stage? isn't that the Tonight Show stage? Yes. At, 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 yes, right? Yeah. Speaking of the Tonight Show, Oscar Levant, all that stuff. Right. Yeah. Um, what do they call the officially? It's NBC. It's where the Tonight Show with Johnny Carson, you know, they did that. But they also did the local news there. They, they had, yep. you know, I remember a big deal was that we were shooting and we had to, uh, we had, it was the days of Paul Moyer. Do you remember Paul oh, Moyer? Oh, yeah. yeah. And um, we just needed to move his space over, you know, a couple spots. And it was like, you know, oh, no. three days of negotiations to, <laughs> to move Paul Moyer's spot. His, I do remember. He was he, not having it. And it was on a Sunday. He wasn't even shooting. Oh, my God. Oh, he wasn't even there. He just didn't want his stuff messed with. He just didn't want his spot messed with. Somehow I remember, I don't know how I'm remembering this, he had a, a bright, I think it was a bright red, 911 DP Targa. Like one of those with the big whale tails. I like that. Um, yeah, like that. really. Did he cut he, you off once on? No, Olive? I just remember being taken that the, a local newsman uh, would have some big ass, flashy, cool car, and he pulled it off. That guy, very, very cool. Yeah, he was a hand. It was hand to hand fight with him and Ron Burgundy would be great. It was a very similar <laughs> kind of, you know. Thing. Uh, speaking of cool uh, uh, network uh, uh, newsmen, kind of a little bit of a reach. Your dad was the voice of ABC for all of my years growing up in Los Angeles. Oh, really? Um, I, I yeah. Know that. Like if I if I played that voice for you, you would you'd it'd knock you out. You'd, you'd be like, oh my god, that's Paul's dad. Uh, no question there. I just want to mention that as something very very cool. Well, actually, so Paul, can, we've talked about this briefly before mm -hmm. once because yeah. you mentioned um, 
your dad was the voice of ABC, as you said, and he he he, he was like the original real promo guy on networks. Yeah. And, yeah. and my recollection is, and so I'm going to say this, and then you can tell me what you know about this and if I'm wrong. He would record the promos for all the network, and the, the promo guys are when you watch the show, when you're watching a network and you hear, coming up tonight at 8 p.m., it's an all-new blah, 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 followed by Bob. <laughs> Oh, that was your dad? That was your and dad? And your dad would mm-hmm. sit in the in the room with the engineer right next to the board, and he had a 416, a shotgun mic, and he was mm-hmm. the first guy to do that in that way. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know for sure if that's exactly th- that technical thing, but that the image of that shotgun mic, uh, you know, he would never go into the booth. He wanted to do it in the control room. Um, was he, because he was actually... In real time, wanting the telling the guy how to modulate his voice and do all the EQ and stuff. I think that had something to do with it too, and I think he, I think he was smart enough or had done it enough to know like, I'm not going in the booth. I'm going to be with you guys. You know, it's mm-hmm. going to be exactly the same. I'm not. You know, um, he also liked to smoke while he was doing it too. And I think right, the other so guys yeah. were <laughs> he, Willie he, likes that. Willie well, does a little I, of that. I, I, not in the booth. Not anymore. No? But 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 I will say that like, and and, and then we'll, I'll get out of the weeds on this. So traditionally, all the voiceover guys, especially in New York, where a lot of it used to be done back in the day, everybody used the mic that's uh, a very common that I do have over here, uh, and what we refer to as an 87, a U87, and it's a sure, great yeah. microphone. Great. Oh, thanks. Well, okay. yeah, yeah, of course. Keep going, 88. Your dad love the changed that by using that shotgun mic, and mm-hmm. he forever changed, and it became the West Coast microphone. That all, So when I would come out here and go to a recording studio, they'd always have a shotgun mic, and it was because of your dad that that became the standard out. Is that out like the here. Johnny Carson one that was on his desk? Is that what a shotgun mic is? What is that? No, that no, no. Oh, okay, bye everybody. Oh, oh see you later, Sean. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, uh, Paul, you did not know that, huh? No, that sounds fantastic to me, mm-hmm. and it doesn't seem too far from from accurate. Even you know, um, he 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 did ha- obsess over that kind of stuff, and, and I probably passed a little bit of it on to me. You know? Were you close <laughs> to him? Yeah, very. Oh, that's nice. I got to go, you know, I had had that opportunity to go to Prospect and Talmadge was where he would go to work at ABC. And, you know, generally, that was sort of my first taste of being around anything that was show business related. And that was magical to me. How old were you at that point? Uh, Anywhere between the ages of probably five and, you know, nine 75 to 79. Did it, did it strike you as being like a peculiar thing for your dad to do? I can say from my own experience, I, and I ask this because I say to my kids sometimes, like, it's when they do stuff, or I do stuff, or they come in a work-related environment, I'm like, it's weird, right, that this is what you're... Because it's weird to me mm-hmm. yeah. if my dad had done it. And I sort of acknowledge it. Was it. Did it seem strange or just because it was your dad? Um, it seems strange only because it was not uh, he, I was proud of him but no one else could recognize this the pride you know it's just such mm-hmm. a behind the scenes gig there's nothing there's nothing kind of famous about it you know you don't walk down the street and somebody say like wow there he is you know or it's your, <laughs> your dad's a baseball player so hit right. home run. it's like well you you know there's no recognition to it really it was this but he, that's what he loved about it so much was that he could just kind of have this independent life coyoteing around town and you know, doing his work and getting paid for it. So you're sitting there, you're watching kind of the the sausage get made uh, for for television and in some aspect. And were you you were you at that point starting to gather these images and interest in this process and what it? Oh, these are the people that are behind the curtain that create mm-hmm, at yeah. least this lane of fake life. And and, yeah. and and that started to build an idea for you about what you might want to do, or get, or can you can you track the moment that you thought. Uh, I, I I want to do something like this. I can't remember because it, for as long as my memories are there, I've wanted to, to make films yeah. for sure. Um, but you have to remember, I mean, Jason, you'll remember that there was like such a dividing line between making films and making television. You yeah, know? yeah. Television yeah. back then was like... You know, anybody can do it. You right. know, right? <laughs> movies yeah. is like this, this gold ring. Like, not right. everybody gets to make movies. You know, right? So you started to experiment with little home movie, and it's yeah, not. I did all it's that. not an uncommon story, right? And no, then it's you the same just... exact story as everybody else. But <laughs> I had the, and I had the, the, 
the camaraderie and that which it was so crazy now i mean i look around my my life right now and i see my relationship to all the people in dark rooms that i work with engineers and things like this when it's the entire process of making a movie and you're like this is exactly what my dad did you go to a dark room each day and you know trying to make something happen and the and the friendships that that he had with those guys i i look back and i think I was really inspired by it. I always th- just thought that's what a friendship was, you know, you, mm-hmm. these kind of... He was very close with all these technicians and guys that, that he worked with. and So those are the people that were around our house. Yeah, I, my one of my first experiences was, was, was people that were very, very close with the crew or at least a, a full understanding of the importance of the crew as opposed to sort of this uh, this sort of terrible traditional kind of look at like, oh, you know, the that's, you know, some people look at crew as sort of soldiers and that, you know, the the folks that are in front of the camera are the ones that are that are super important when it yeah. could when the uh, when the opposite is actually the truth. And so was that uh, did did that start then understanding that, oh, my God, this is r- this is really difficult. And there's actually nobody on the set there that doesn't need to be there. Well, the only people that don't need to be there are like studio executives and right. producers, and you know that. <laughs> what I learned probably from my dad, it was like whoever's whoever's you know, you kick all the people out of the room that are not completely completely essential <laughs> to, the, to yeah. the product. You know, and you learn pretty quickly who isn't. You know, they scatter. Yeah, yeah. So, so grabbing those uh, early video cameras, movie cameras, stuff like that. That's sort of uh, pretty common story where you kind of point a camera at stuff and you kind of d- take little little kid films and you little army men and the, that's that's not uncommon but what about the writing part did do you remember th- your first experience looking at a blank piece of paper and trying to figure out how to start from zero uh, do you remember that being humbling or or surprisingly easy that's a really good question because i think you're right that um the story of you know the filmmaker with the eight millimeter camera and then onto the video cameras like there's a million of them and that's generally how everybody starts um but the writing part always excited me um because i liked it i i I think i I got lucky that i liked it i liked putting paper into a typewriter Mm -hmm. and typing out ideas and i liked the i liked seeing it on the page i liked i liked looking at that idea um I, I don't know. I, from an early age, I've always liked writing and formulating things on on paper. And l- when you learn on a typewriter, you learn how to make it right the first time because <laughs> the last thing that you want to do is, <laughs> you know, is go through that. And I had and I had um, the the one. You still script, use a typewriter? No, I don't. I mean, from time to time, I will just for fun to mix it up. But no, yeah. I don't use a typewriter anymore. Um, but I remember the one um, script that I had. I, I think I have to credit my mother for this. Is I had uh, the script for Holy Grail. Oh wow! Um, Monty Python. Monty Python. Monty Python. It was published wow. as a little, little book, and and I loved that movie so much. So this is like probably eight seventy eight or seventy nine. Whenever. By the way, they're out. both like Monty Python. No, the actual Holy Grail. You. <laughs> We're helping Tracy. Okay. <laughs> um, so I I had the the what what was the script for that, and I and then. Um, I just copied that. I just copied how the, the formatting was of that. It was a great way to learn. So mm. I, I can't think writing is either something that you like doing or you don't like doing. I mean, you know, it's, it's yeah. I, I got a dumb, dummy question. When what? you... No shit. <laughs> when you drive... When you're just driving around, like, the... <laughs> driving around during the day with your kids or whatever, do you constantly think in images or see images and think of filmmaking? Like, do you... Is it hard to turn it off? Yeah, it's no. Um, <laughs> it's it's easy to turn off. Oh, okay, never mind. It's not. No, I don't like walk around like Rain Man or something like that. Like, <laughs> because you know. I, I I always think of like like whenever I'm driving around, I always see like images. I'm like, God, that'd be such. And I see like a frame around it or something. I'm not a filmmaker. But Especially when I, you know, like when you're listening to music, do you find that happening, Sean? All right? the time. You All basically the time start cutting listen. videos, right? Yeah, on the, don't on the you big do that, beat Jerry? change, your eyes go right, you know, and <laughs> I, I dork out like that. Too. How yeah. many how many wham inspired movies have you made, Sean, in your head? Oh, there's got to be like twelve. <laughs> I mean, you know, they wake me up before you go. Go was my holy grail. 
Yeah. I understand. You know, they're like, I was like, I can't believe there's a just stripper. lends itself to a real <laughs> cinematic. <laughs> Paul, what was it? This could be the best interview. Just, I like, I just, it's if the you don't get to talk, let Paul. You guys, I know, and this is Quiet. why I like it. I just want to hear you guys. <laughs> I have to tell you, my favorite, I heard, listen to, I don't, uh, listen to. You haven't listened to this. I have, of course I have. But the one joke that stuck with me forever and ever and ever was um, Will saying something about um, your father, Jason, mm-hmm. and he and by father he meant the security guard of the 20th Century Fox. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds about Don't right. Don't make Jason cry. <laughs> Don't make Jason and cry. It, it stuck with me <laughs> where I think about it. That's what I think about, Sean, when I'm driving down the road okay. every once in a while. I'll, I'll think about something dad. pops into your head. You think, God, that was really, 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 really funny. And I'll, you know. It's surprising when you're in the car and you're driving around you're not thinking about Sean. Sean's dad peeling away from the house. Because <laughs> he was real handy in a car. Yeah. Exactly. Still hasn't come back. Exactly. <laughs> and we will be right back. Listener, Smartless gets support from Tonal. And, uh, you know, they are the world's smartest home gym and personal trainer that adapts to you for real-time results to help you get stronger and faster. And, uh, you know, they not only support the podcast here, but they have supported my muscular structure for the last, you know, few weeks or so. I, I got to tell you, uh, this is... Uh, this is working, and and plus even when I when like when I'm away from the house and I might go into another gym with just like sort of regular machines, that now I know how to use those machines because Tonal this all these machines in one has taught me how to use all these different sort of exercises. So I'm learning proper form, proper terminology. It's I'm just I'm basically I've got more confidence now when I'm when I'm working out. I'm no longer uh, flabby body, no longer flabby mind. Okay. Uh, listen, Tonal, the, the way they do that, they use 17 sensors to, to provide real-time form feedback to ensure the perfect form with every movement. So you get the most out of every workout. Forget the plates and the dumbbells. Tonal's revolutionary digital weight system replaces an entire traditional gym in one compact design. The adjustable arms move to provide more than 200 exercises for a full-body workout, including squats, deadlifts, bench presses, overhead pulls, bicep curls, more No matter your experience level, Tonal has thousands of personalized workouts from strength training to HIIT to yoga to boot camp, bar, and more. It all helps you unlock your strongest self. So what are you waiting for? Try Tonal in your home for 30 days. Tonal's so confident you're going to love it, they're going to offer you a full money-back guarantee. If you don't like it after 30 days, you can now get Tonal from $63 per month and 0% interest over 48 months. Visit Tonal.com for a limited time to get $100 off when you use promo code SMARTLESS at checkout. That's T-O-N-A-L.com, promo code SMARTLESS. Tonal, be your strongest. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Relationships take work, right? I know it. You know it. A lot of us will drop anything to go help someone we care about. We'll go out of our way to treat other people well, but how often do we give ourselves the same treatment? You know, we all have, like, busy lives, and and it's hard to take time for ourselves, but I found that going to therapy helps me have a better, healthy mind, which makes me be present and there for other people that I love in my life, if that makes sense. This month, BetterHelp Online Therapy wants to remind you to take care of your most important relationship, the one you have with yourself. Whether it's hitting the gym, making time for your haircut, or even trying therapy, you are your greatest asset. So invest the time and effort into yourself like you do for other people, right? I do therapy regularly. Uh, It helps clear my mind. It helps me stay focused. It helps me stay present. It fills me with gratitude. And, and the tools I need to be grateful for every single thing and every single person in my life have only benefited from therapy. I encourage you to do the same. It is a life enriching thing. And your loved one is really going to enjoy it too and they're going to appreciate it. BetterHelp is online therapy that offers video, phone, and even live chat sessions with your therapist so you don't have to see anyone on camera if you don't want to. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy and you can be matched with a therapist in under 48 hours. Give it a try and see why over 2 million people have used BetterHelp online therapy. Smartless listeners get 10% off their first month at betterhelp.com slash smartless. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash smartless. 
Thanks to Embark for sponsoring the show. Did you know that 75% of dogs are at risk or uh, a carrier for a genetic health condition? That's a true story. So Embark gives you hundreds of actionable health insights with a simple cheek swab. When you know your dog has an increased risk of a health condition, you can be proactive with their health and work with your vet on a personalized care plan. So I found out that um, my dog, Bella, um, we, I did, we did the cheek swab and we sent it into Embark. And we found out that she just has this one kind of uh, genetic predisposition but that is uh, at very low risk. And so she's kind of good. And we were happy to know that. We found out that that she's a, uh, that she is indeed uh, a Labrador and that she has zero wolfiness. So that was interesting. Now I, however, have 78% wolfiness, which is odd because I didn't even, I don't remember doing a DNA. T- I don't remember much. I remember I was in the woods at night. <laughs> anyway, I'll save that for a different different story. Embark offers the most scientifically advanced dog DNA test, and their test analyzes more than 230,000 genetic markers, and that's over twice as much genetic data than the uh, competition. So right now, Embark has a limited time offer on their breed and health kit and purebred kit for our listener. Go to EmbarkVet.com to get free shipping and save $50 with promo code SMARTLESS. Visit EmbarkVet.com and use promo code SMARTLESS to save 50 bucks today. And now back to the show. Paul, what, what, and forgive us for just being such fools. I'm sure we ruined many of your days having to listen to it. But wait, I want to know about. I want to know about. Okay, I, definitely. Jump, yeah, just cut them off, Sean. If you get an idea, yeah, start talking. <laughs> go ahead, Will. Wait, I just want to get this out of the Oscar way. Oscar Levant over there. I, I, <laughs> I think I've seen, I'm pretty sure I've seen every single one of your films. Okay. And always been amazed by each one. But I just want to get this out of the way before I forget. Boogie Nights. Is it true that that Leo was up for the part, but Mark got it? Or Leo turned it down because he did Titanic? Or is there any truth to any of that? Sean loves the dirt, Paul. That is very true, is that I asked Leo to be in Boogie Nights. And he spent many, many months agonizing and debating oh. about it. Um, months. And... And ultimately, um, what I didn't realize or kind of came to realize about halfway into that, this sort of long decision-making process is that he was, he had a choice to make, which was to either do Titanic or to do Boogie Nights. And he chose to do Titanic, which, of course, in the long run, catapulted him to this massive worldwide fame. But on the other hand, I think, possibly, but I think it was, we laugh about it now, but he, he, you know, regrets missing the experience and doing it but yeah that's that's true yeah that's right i just always wondered that it'd be um well now you know Not, so well, see, and i would have never <laughs> never known will was your question as good as that not as good as that actually that was very interesting and well done sean uh, Congrats. i like the idea Paul, back to google was, back to google sean <laughs> i thought you Go were ahead, gonna will. say i thought you were gonna say and i to this day i still think leo made a huge error in judgment <laughs> like, you, you never let it go but but what was, I, no, the question actually was just simply, what was that first thing that you, that you wrote and you said, I should film this? Yeah. And that you, first thing you actually put to film that you, from your own words. Well, I did like short treatments and shot lists and things like that. But really, I, the, when I, funny enough that when I was um, 16, just about to turn 17, I wrote a short film that was called the Dirk Diggler story that was what Boogie Nights became. Uh-huh. And it was like a 20, it was like a 23 or 24 page script. But I did it in the format that was, it was sort of popular at the time. And all I had was this sort of bad video camera. So I realized it wasn't going to look good. It wasn't going to look like a movie. So I wrote this thing that was about 23 pages long. And it was interviews with people looking back at the life of this guy, Dirk Diggler. Um, oh, A Current Affair was a very popular show at that time. I don't know if you remember that. <laughs> yeah, but they yeah. would always have these insanely overdramatic, you know, and it was so preposterous that it was so trying to find a way into the story that I thought was interesting, which is the pornography that had surrounded me my whole life living where I lived. Like, it was so obvious what was around me. And then writing it in this format was like a doable thing. Like, okay, I can get somebody and do an, an interview with them, you know. I mean, it's a, it's a format that's still at work, you know. Um, but at the time, it was really like the most convenient 
and plausible way into a story with the equipment that you had at hand. Wow. Did you, have you transferred that from from V? Was it VHS? Uh, ye, no, it was eight millimeter, eight millimeter video. So of high eight, I think they were. Have you transferred it. it to something that'll last? And are we ever going to see it? Hopefully not. Hopefully it's somewhere. <laughs> no, it's 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 it's, it's transferred within an inch of its life. It's available. I think it maybe it's on YouTube. I'd have to look. Oh again. really? Yeah, I'm not sure. Wow. It's not terrible. There's still some jokes that are the same and things than and some pieces that, you know, remained in Boogie Nights. You know, what what was great about that was that what I didn't even realize at the time in terms of the writing, in terms of really learning how to write, was that I'd created this kind of these fictional characters in this fake documentary, right? And then I realized what I had to do was adapt that, adapt this these fake lives into a movie. And I spent the next, um, well, probably about 10 years doing that. So I like wrote a 90-page version of this documentary. And then I realized, well, I don't want to do that. That's a kind of, that's not the right format for this. I want to write this as a fictional film. So I did that, you know, for, for 10 years. I guess it was the way that I learned how to write, really, was practicing telling this story in multiple different ways. It's funny that that seems to be a recurring theme with a lot of filmmakers and writers. I know, you know, Kenny Lonergan used to do, um, at back in Naked Angels in this theater company in New York in the 90s, he did various scene nights on Monday nights where he would do the, the scene about a brother and a sister and then just this guy who was kind of lost in his 20s in New York, et cetera, et cetera. And it took on a bunch of different incarnations, a bunch of different scenes, which eventually then became This Is Our Youth, the play right. that my then-girlfriend Missy Yeager was in with Ruff, Mark Ruffalo mm -hmm. and Josh Hamilton that then became kind of really, I, I think, the inspiration for uh, You Can Count On Me, you know, and and mm. but it was like this similar story, similar theme that he told in various ways over at least 15 years before he kind of landed on on that. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you can probably relate to that. For sure. You know, maybe there's leftovers and or you're just, I don't know, how deep is your well, I guess. You just keep it. Yeah. <laughs> well, to, to that point, I mean, do you find that it was basically a, a, a peeling the onion further and further back on a specific theme that you thought this sort of story was a fun example of? Um, and if so, what is that theme? Yeah, but that's a, can you write a theme? I can never write a theme. Well, mm -hmm. I mean, but I mean, you tell me, you know, what you're doing, um, a theme of being, let's say, uh, the, the, the irresponsible chase of fame. Let's no, say you could apply I never, to that. I never have anything good like that. I always yeah. have like, just like, <laughs> no, like I never ever have, I have more like facts, like, well, what would, what really happens here? Mm -hmm. And some steal from real life, like. Every story was essentially the same, you know, it was like if if the exaggerated version was the guy who steps off the bus and, you know, kind of comes to Hollywood with big dreams right. and takes his pants off and then the next thing you know, he's a big star and it was any classic rise and fall story. So I'm always just sort of following any steps of, of reality. I mean, I, I don't know, I never... I get so scared of writing to a theme or having anything like that beforehand. I can remember at a certain point maybe needing help, um, like, like, what is the story? And luckily enough, coming across Singing in the Rain and being like, oh, right. It's just the same thing as, like, silent talkies, you know? It's, it's this transitional time in whatever industry they're going from shooting on film to shooting on video. Mm -hmm. Like, use things like this to tell your story and, ho and whatever themes will will just emerge later. Well, yes, so you write a story and you basically just write a script because it's, uh, to oversimplify it, you, you, this, this, this event runs to this event and this event and this event and now we have an ending and it's a fun story and now you shoot it and all that worked out well and now you're in the editing room and you start to shape this, pardon the phrase, experience for the audience and it starts to sort of um, present itself as a film and you start working with either temp music or the actual score and maybe themes start to develop for you as a viewer as you're viewing it um, trying to keep the the optics of a viewer mm -hmm. um, do you allow that to happen and then does that inform the way you finish the film and and oh here's here's a little theme that's existing underneath this crunchy story that's kind of fun um, mm -hmm. Does that, does that, do you find that that happens? 
I find that that's exactly what happens with the exception that it, that it, that it does happen a, a little bit earlier. You yeah. know, that, that once you, I mean, listen, I'm not blind, you know, as you, as you're writing something, you maybe have, you, you're fighting off the idea that a theme is yeah. right in front of your face, but just because you want to try to tell something factually and what ends up emerging emerges and you can't fight it. Or it hopefully you like it. You're, you're enjoying what's happening. But you, I think it, and you, you keep a half an eye on it, but really you keep the other eye on what are the facts? What are the facts? What are the facts of the story? You know, um, why, why is that? Because I don't know, I find films that overindulge in telling me the right. theme are, are annoying, you know, right. and uh-huh. boring. Um, so... But yes, to your point, that once you and then you get into shooting and you're seeing dailies and you're seeing stuff emerge that is really exciting or stuff that is unexpected and you either embrace it or you say, perhaps this is not going in the right direction. Mm-hmm. But very more often than not, you can't stop what's coming, nor should you, that you have to kind of be surrender. You're guiding a ship, but you're also surrendering a bit to the path that, that's happening. Mm-hmm. And, you know, performances kind of get bigger or smaller, whatever ends up happening. Um, and then it, it just keeps on going, and you keep refining that um, through the editing and, and yeah. all that. One of the, if we can get into staying on the idea of themes, one of the themes, of uh, it seems to me, of your films is that they're very specific visually and stylistically, um, each one different in its own way. And, and But you they do seem so specific in the writing. And, and so what is your relationship like, again, going deeper into the weeds on filmmaking, but what is your relationship like with um, your production designer and your, uh, and your DP leading up to when you actually shoot? Because it does seem like all of your films, I told you once at, at risk of in further embarrassment to myself and, and to you, um, that, you know, for instance, there will be blood. I, I feel like it should be just hung in, in MoMA and left there uh, for people to watch. It's an incredible piece of art in every way from the writing to the direction to the, uh, um, to the art direction, you know, production. What is that like for you leading up to actually rolling film and working with those departments? Well, it's the great joy of collaboration, particularly when you're doing it with somebody that you love uh, and and work with. Like, for instance, on that film, I I had never worked with Jack Fisk, who's one of the great production designers who started his career with Terrence Malick and David Lynch. Um, They kind of go back to their beginnings together. Anyway, I contacted Jack Fisk and, and had written the script, and I needed to kind of create... I needed a lot of help with making oil derricks and the recreation of an early California town. And there was only one person that helped do that. So it started a great collaboration. Um, Jack Fisk was, you know, we were kind of trying to learn how to get oil out of the ground and, and, and really trying to be really, you know, do, do our research. And he said the greatest thing. He's like, you know, I found that if you, we can just get a children's book about this, it's really better than trying to really understand how to do it with all this, these kind of books mm-hmm. that are this thick. And, mm-hmm. and it was one of these great lessons in like, yeah, get the children's book first and don't be, you know, because it'll have drawings, it'll be simple. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and it was really like, funny. wow, Jack Fisk gets the children's book first. All right, <laughs> that's really good advice. That's but um, we had the incredible joy of going to scout locations together and find um, a place to make this film. And I learned from him um, one incredible trick that I still try to to make true is that the more you can have a location where everything's close together, the more freedom you have. Um, Here's what I mean by that is that if you shoot a scene, you know, over here and you see it a few days later, you think that's the worst scene that we've ever done. We, uh, we should really try to do it again is that you can go do it again. Mm. You know, uh. you, you kind of create your own, you create your own back lot, you create your own mm-hmm. y- universe and try as, as much as you possibly can to not move too much, but to have a variety of different looks and things happening. So that, I don't know, I'm lost in whatever your question was, it was kind of like the collaboration. That's, so, well, the simplicity sometimes yields some of the, the most complex and sophisticated results, perhaps. Yeah. And, and sure. It, That's my which, role. Yeah. Um, it did, was, it, was there a similar uh, process with Johnny Greenwood, who did the, 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 for Tracy, was the composer on that film? I believe it was the first time he'd composed 
music for yeah. a film and the first time you guys worked together? Yeah, yeah. He, there was a piece of music that he had written for orchestra because he was he was already well versed in how to write for string instruments. It wasn't yeah. like, don't let him fool you. I mean, I know he's, um, but uh, obviously the, his score was incredible, as was everything else in the film. It was really incredible, and um, it's an opportunity. You know, look, I, I think I, I don't. No, there was no kind of crazy weird instrumentation or something like that. He he does do funny things with instruments where he'll detune certain pieces of the orchestra and keep others in tune, and so he has the ability to make it sound very familiar. You're hearing string instruments but that sounds just out of body enough that you can't quite place it. So he's brilliant like that, but that sort of stuff, it's, you know, it's nice, it's trickery, but he he, he writes beautiful music that complements the film, and they, they, they go hand in hand, and I, I, it was the beginning of a beautiful collaboration. Do you consciously keep that in mind when you're writing, like spaces, or do you listen to stuff when you write? Or? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I had all kinds of... The stuff that I was listening to was stuff that he likes anyway. Was it Penderecki or Schubert or, you know, um, even that the piece that he had written for the BBC Orchestra. So that was already kind of informing where my head was at. Mm -hmm. um, and it was nice to go to him and say, like, you know, the movie lends itself, too, to just, to, like, wide open spaces and, like, a huge opportunity to fill long gaps of silence with music that can either be gigantically loud or even just simmering underneath. So yeah. it was quite a good entrance into the game of, for him. I love that. What's the music that you put on when you go, like, pick up the kids from school or whatever? <laughs> like, what, do you, what, what are your bands? Yeah, what's the music you have to take off the stereo when your kids get in and put on... Uh, well, they're already sick of that smile record. They've been hearing that yeah, enough. Yeah, they're, of they're like, they're like, enough with that. Enough, enough, enough. <laughs> so, well, come on. What's um, Pearl listening to right now? Pearl is listening to. Well, you know what she's listening to is anything, and I don't know in any of the, 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 the many of the artists, but um, we just we're kind of obsessed right now with this film, The Worst Person in the World. Yeah, I don't know oh, if you yeah. guys have seen I it. I seen the trailer. It looks great. Ah, oh, it's fucking magical. This yeah. film, and it's got this great soundtrack. So we've just kind of been listening to all this variety of songs on that soundtrack, which is everything from like. Harry Nilsson and Todd Rundgren to a lot of new stuff that I've never heard in my life, you know. Yeah. Um, I want to ask you something about, you know, s streaming versus wide release and, and where we're at in the business of that. And, you know, I was having this conversation with a friend and we were talking about how, for example, West Side Story or Licorice Pizza or whatever it is that's out there that's fantastic right now, how that would have fared with a really long wide release run, would anybody see these things? Are we really truly at the point where we just want to see stuff in our homes? But to the filmmaker, I imagine, you want it to be seen on that big screen for because of the genre of filmmaking, right? Because of the thing that lends itself to that. So what are your thoughts about that? Well, yeah, I mean, <clears throat> I... I don't know. I I kind of I kind of I don't know. I mean, I like everything. You know. I mean, I really do. I, I sound like Daniel Plainview. Is like I like all kinds of religions. They're all fucking you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah, to yeah. Me. Like, and then I'm he sticks gonna, it in your back. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But wait. But when you make a movie, isn't the idea in your head? I can't wait to see this on the big screen. Yes. In fact, right. right. Absolutely. Of and so with the with the business of this business. It just seems to be less and less that if it's not one of these big superhero movies, it's going to... Well, listen, that's exactly right. I mean, to that point is um, there's probably, you know, 30 theaters in this country where it would look great and sound great, and the rest are fucking filth. I'm sorry, yeah. but it's like, you know, it, and that's the sad truth of it is that I can understand why everybody says, like, Oh, piss off! I'm staying at home. You know what? Wh wh you want me to pay for a babysitter and pay for parking and come in and look at this shit and look at it on a fucking screen that that you guys haven't even you know I don't know. I'm, it's hard to defend at a certain point. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. I'm sure that if God forbid the the business became a place where it's only event movies in in right. in, in theaters and the only place that you can expect your film to be seen is at home based on it's not a big effects thing or whatever. You'd, you'd much rather people see a film, be able to make films and have them see it at home than make no films at all. Right, but I don't know. I, I think that's kind of bullshit too because the reason why is um, when all these theaters were opening up 
again, you know, you have these huge, gigantic 25 plexes and stuff like that. And everybody was crying. Oh, they're empty. It was like, well, what did you fucking think was going to happen? But if you go to any of the great theaters, let's say in Los Angeles or New York that are playing specialty programming, they're packed with people. Right. They're all turning out. They're film lovers. They're people that you know are going to come out and turn out for this thing. And because there's one theater with 400 seats that they can fill and they can do two shows a day or three shows a day and people will still turn up. It was like everyone's scratching their head. No one's coming back for the movies. It's like, well, they're not coming back to your these weird, horrible pyramids that we've built. But Paul, I, I I think that what you're maybe you're saying, and I don't want to put words in your mouth, but but is there there is a little bit of um, well, of course they're not going to come back because look what you're putting in the theaters is part of the problem. A and I, and and I can say that, and I know it's hard for you to say because of your position in the in the films that you make, and you probably don't want to be that guy who 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 says that. But you make the kind of films that you want that are really uh, uh, incredible films, and, and at the same time you don't seek out. Um, recognition for yourself in a way that a lot of other filmmakers seem to do. It's never about your own sort of, uh, you know, increasing your personal fame. So my question to you is, how much of that are you aware of show business, in fact? Or are you kind of in your bubble of making the films that you make? No, um, I do, and then I don't. I slip in and out of it because I love... Part of loving... um, movies as much as I do, the history of movies and my, you know, my obsession with this work, which has been with me forever and will, is what I've made of my life. Um, it, it does involve being fascinated with the the way that it moves, you know. Um, like we were talking about before with Singing in the Rain, you know, that's a fantastic story, the way that ever, what happened to the movie business when it changed from talkies to... So I constantly try to keep an eye on that or try to understand it or have enough friends in this business so from over the years that I can call up and ask, you know, what does this mean? What's, what does this mean when this film is doing well? Or what, do you, what is, what is going to happen here? What, what ties do you see turning? And it's nice to gauge that stuff. I, I, I love this business and I love, I love movies so much that I have a real interest in seeing it survive. But more often than not, the, the volume of my day becomes more about film preservation, you know, um, and, and film history and trying to keep that stuff alive. Cause, um, and then just sort of looking to see what's happening and reacting, I suppose, but I don't know. Um, how often do you collaborate with, with Quentin Tarantino on those efforts? Uh, cause I know he's, he's got a real passion for the history of cinema and, and, and turning, turning people on to stuff that perhaps they haven't seen. He's great about all that. Um, but he, uh, he's amazing about it. One of the best, but he also really runs in his own lane, you know, because he, he, the person who I collaborate the most with that is Scorsese because he has the film foundation. He, since the seventies, since the late seventies, early eighties, um, went around to every, every studio in town, uh, and said, look, you know, this is when it was really tragic. When, when the, the the products they had made since you know since their existence had, were really fading away and dying and weren't being taken care of. You have to. This is sort of just on the cusp of VHS coming around and home entertainment. So he was really out there at the very beginning with the Film Foundation, saying, "This is the biggest cultural historical thing that this country has to to offer, and we have to preserve it, and we have to take care of it. We have to invest money and time and and." manpower into figuring this out so being a part of his film foundation has been i mean one of the great honors of my life it's great we'll be right back smartless is brought to you by squarespace oh squarespace yep oh it's the space that's square yeah yeah it's yeah. from websites and online stores to marketing tools and analytics squarespace, oh, I love squarespace. it's the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful uh online presence in in uh Run your business. Oh, I love business. I yeah, love you, business. well, I know you do because it's in a Squarespace. I love Squarespace. I know you love Squarespace. Square, it, it, well, it's everything to sell anything. Squarespace yeah. has the tools you need to get tools. your business oh, off the tools. ground. You love getting off the ground, I right? Love the ground. Uh, including e-commerce templates. Oh, I love templates. You were just talking, remember you were before, you were, uh, we were at lunch said, in the in the I said templates, how much I love you said templates. Uh, e-commerce templates. Uh, inventory management's a big thing for you. A, a simple checkout process and secure payments mm. whenever you sell oh, yes. squarespace has squarespace. merchandising features to make your products look their best online well display posts from your social profiles on your website 
you know, automatically push website content to your favorite social media channels so your followers can share it too. What's French for Squarespace? It's Squarespace. So, so look, just check out squarespace.com slash smartless for a free trial. And, and when you're ready to launch and use the offer code smartless to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain, that's what you're going to do. And that's squarespace.com slash smartless offer code smartless. We're supported by Viore. Oh, sorry, so, Viore. That's not that's not great. So I'll just do I'll do that when we get okay. to Viore. Um, is a okay. fresh perspective on performance apparel. Yeah, everything is designed to work out in, but doesn't look or or feel like it. No, no, no. Yeah, these are garments yeah. are designed to perform while still looking great, mm-hmm. kind of like a handsome spin instructor. <laughs> sure. Right. Sure. Thinking, you've got a, you've got somebody in mind. Go ahead. Keep well, going. yeah. You know, um, I, I I like the core short. Just can I, I want to go on record as saying I like the core short a lot. I toss on the core short, okay? And I'm running around. I'm doing my things. I'm 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 talking to people. I'm doing the meetings. I'm in the zooms. I'm going to get coffee. I'm going to a thing. Blah blah blah. blah. Then I pop into the gym. I do. I'm in and out of there real quick. I'm I don't, I'm never there longer than three hours. I'm in. I'm sure. out. And yeah. then I'm back on with my day. And I can wear the core short for all of it. Now some other popular items that I can talk about here yeah. uh, is the the women's performance jogger. Yeah, I, you I loved have, that. I've yeah. loved it for uh, longer than they've been yeah. selling it, uh, and mm-hmm. I convinced them to finally uh, put it in the shops. Um, yeah. Also, the women's daily legging. That's it so just good. it creates such a silhouette. Yeah. Um, so Viore is an investment in your happiness. For our listeners, they're offering twenty percent off your first purchase. So get yourself some of the most comfortable and versatile clothing on the planet at viore.com slash smart. List. That's V U O R I spells Fiore dot com slash smartless. Not only are you going to receive 20% off your first purchase, you'll also get free shipping on any U.S. orders over $75 and free returns. Yeah, so go to Fiore.com slash smartless and discover the versatility of Fiore clothing. Our next partner is a product that I pretty much use every day. And uh, I started taking Athletic Greens because um, I kind of wanted to get more energy. I wanted to get some nutrients in my body. And I was sick and tired of having to look up uh, all the different, uh, you know, vitamins and stuff that I was going to have to take. Sorry, it's vitamins. It's vitamins. Where are we right now? We're in America. Okay, okay. so it's vitamins. You're right. Yeah. So I'm absorbing 75 high-quality uh-huh. vitamins, minerals, whole food source, superfoods, probiotics, and aptogens? No, adaptogens. adaptogens. Oh, adaptogens. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Now that apparently is uh, going to help me start my day right, right? Well, this is, yeah, well, it's because this special blend of ingredients that you just talked about, this supports your gut health, your nervous system, your immune system, your energy, recovery, oh, focus, aging, all the things. All. And also your, 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 your nervous system system because I know you get very nervous. I get very nervous. I've been using Athletic Greens AG1 as we call it but in the biz. I've been yeah. using it for about 18 months I guess and it has been unbelievable and, it's, and it tastes great and it's so easy and it's lifestyle friendly. So whether you eat uh, keto or paleo or vegan or dairy free or gluten free, I can't keep up with you JB because from week to week it's one of these, these dang things. It doesn't matter. But I'm really trying to keep a hold of my wallet right now yeah. and so you know the fact that this thing costs less than three dollars a day i mean mm-hmm. I, look i'm just investing in my health and it's yeah. cheaper than than my cold brew habit <laughs> which is which is pretty significant oh yeah, yeah. We can tell. ag1 is a small micro habit uh, with big benefits yeah. it's one of the healthy habits you can have it's a uh, one thing you can do every single day to take great care of yourself. And the way you can do that right now, it's time to reclaim your health and arm your immune system with convenient daily nutrition, especially, you know, with the flu and cold season and everything. Athletic Greens is going to give everybody a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs with your first purchase. All you got to do, gang, is visit athleticgreens.com slash smartless, okay? Again, that is athleticgreens.com slash smartless to take ownership over your health and pick up the ultimate daily nutritional insurance. All right, back to the show. Paul, I know you're a huge, you're a big comedy fan, mm-hmm. and um, and you've obviously collaborated with uh, with Sandler, and you and married the funniest woman in Hollywood. 
Yeah. yeah or in the maybe, world. Uh, we, maybe we can just say the world. Or Tracy. I mean, Maya um, Rudolph, Tracy. Maya was one of our first guests. I, I said that to her. I said, you were one of the first guests. She's like, no, no, I was. I said, yeah. I think you were. She yeah. was like we one of the start first strong. two or three, right? Uh-huh. Yeah. Maya's one of those people, as you know, Did Paul, you give her a piece w- of the pie? Because no, we no. We should have. We sent her a cake, though. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, she should have but she is that. one of those people that anytime you're doing anything funny, you go, so then it would be great. And then, you, oh God, if we could get Maya. Just to like, stamp it. Yeah, yeah you know, because yeah, yeah. she's so just. <laughs> How did you I, guys meet? Where did that, where, where did that I, no, as Will was saying, you've been a, a huge fan of comedy for a long time. Was it just, did you just fan out on her and, and say, will you have dinner with me? It was just like that. Yeah, yeah. it's simple, right? <laughs> Or did you swipe left or right? How does I don't know how it see, works. Paul, see, Paul, it's not easy, is it? It's not easy to bite your tongue with Bateman. <laughs> he wants to hurt me, I know. I, it, you know, it's funny. Um, I'm not sure what it is that it's, I guess it's like anything like, you know, I don't know. Um, there's like, you know, actors that wanted to be rock stars or, um, you know, musicians wanted to be actors. Like people that making serious films really just like uh, the, the one thing they really loved was comedies, you right. know. Like I I had made these films. And I, I thought that they were funny, but people Dude, were saying like, you know, it's not. <laughs> You're, you make really oh, funny come on. shit. <laughs> well, I think, I think. Really, really. But you never ask for a laugh and that's what makes it so goddamn funny. There's no winking. It's great. Sorry, go Thank ahead. you. Because I, yeah, because everything, everything that, that I watched or in my daily kind of existence was just like, I just devoured that stuff. And I met Maya when she'd started SNL. Um, um, and How? yeah. What, what, what was that meeting? How'd you guys meet? Well, you know, the funny thing is, is that Does I... Does she I, make you laugh at, at home too, Paul? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but she sure makes us laugh. <laughs> She just must be a cut up at home. Oh. <laughs> Somebody once said to me, that reminds me, I think I told this once. Somebody said to me years ago, <laughs> when when Amy and I were uh, married, they said, What's it like being married to the funny funniest person in America? And I said, You'd have to ask my wife. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, but <laughs> I love that. Do you find that funny people are generally pretty serious when they're at home? Yes. yes. Uh huh. <laughs> Nothing funny about it. <laughs> but I do want to know that. How, how did how did you meet Paul? How did you and Miami? I really do want to. We know. we we um at SNL, right? At SNL, I that was the t- the time with Will Ferrell and Molly Shannon, and I had met Molly Shannon, and she said, you know, you could come and you can see how we do this. And <clears throat> at the time, I was writing Punch Drunk Love, and I was obsessed with with that time that Sandler had been there, so I accepted that offer to come and look and then watch, you know, behind the scenes. And then Molly said, well, you know, you let direct a, you can direct a short. So I directed a short with her oh, in it oh. and just got to kind of witness the inner workings of this whole thing. And at that time, I was also getting to know Sandler and asking him about his time there. I was getting ready to make Punch Drunk Love with him. And as I was getting ready to leave after my week there, my head was spinning. I was like, well, that was great, but I don't want to fucking do that again because it was so <laughs> much, it was a different pace of work and I w- was thrilled to have done it, but that was enough of a taste. Mm. Um, they said there was a piece of paper that somebody had put in my hands or something like that and I looked at it and it, it, it w- w- the information was on it that there was a, a new cast member c- starting next week and her name was Maya Rudolph. And I can remember seeing her name on that piece of paper. I don't know if you've had any feeling like this, but you see something for the first time and you realize that my life has just changed. I don't know how. I don't know why. I don't know what just happened. And so... Wow. But, you know, you quickly you kind of move on. You just... Whatever. You, you have something else to do. You have to... You know. Mm-hmm. But looking back, I... Obviously, it, that impulse, whatever that kind of that shining kind of feeling that that can happen to any of us if we're open to it happened. Wow. Yeah. And so I um, I roamed around and then I, I saw her um, on television and I saw what she was doing and I had t- stayed in touch with a few people from the show and I said, like, my God, this this woman's amazing. And I, on, on my way back through, um, I stopped to watch and we met um, at the show, and then um, I had to go on to London and I f- to f- to work on Punch Drunk Love, and then I got to London. And I said, "Well, something didn't feel right," and I just came back to New York. Wow! 
and I came back, and then uh, that's uh, fucking beautiful, man. Yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, for, whoa, real, you, for real. So you come back to New York because you felt drawn back to her and called her yeah. and said, "Let's go out." Yeah. Oh, no, man. I love that. That's I wanted so cool. to make a joke in there so badly, but I no. love that story. I wanted He's to melted that- my cold heart. Sean had that feeling, that same feeling of seeing something written when they, somebody pushed a flyer for a new Vons that was opening around the corner for him. <laughs> oh, I thought you were saying when he drove by a new Chin Chin and he had to double back. And, he, yeah. he knew his life was no, changed. I've had to turn back, and I haven't left since. Jason, Jason felt the same way when he found out that Deadline Hollywood had an app. Um, but, but, but that is... That's fucking incredible, man. I love that. Maya reminds me too, Paul, that you and I born the same day, same year. Every year she reminds me. Oh, I wow. think of it all the time. We're 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 one and the same, Sean. No. That is right. June twenty sixth. Are you guys? June twenty sixth, nineteen seventy. June twenty sixth, nineteen seventy. You two guys are. Yeah. But wow. what city were you born in? Chicago, Evergreen Park. I was born in the hospital in Evergreen Park, but I just say Chicago. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. You? I was born um. Uh, here in, Lo- in Los Angeles at what is now the Scientology uh, Center, wh- which was um, St. Uh, John's, I guess it was. Cedar- oh, wow. Cedar- it was. No, it was Cedars of Lebanon, it was called. Uh, On Franklin? Or no, no, the far east Right there the- where uh, Sunset and Hollywood meet, that, that big they blue building. Almost near Prospect. Oh, yeah, wow. right, right around the corner from, from ca- It went from Catholic to Scientology, that building? That's right. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, hey, um, you know, you mentioned Sandler. Uh, what was it you saw in Adam earlier than anybody else did? Well, I always liked it when Adam would get angry. You know, the violent <laughs> part of him would come out. <laughs> uh, and it was like, and I, I guess I saw, um, the story that I remember, there was a s- sketch called The Denise Show. Um, where he's talking to his ex-girlfriend, Denise, who's played yeah. by Shannon Doherty. And, and it's a funny enough premise. And, and he, he keeps trying to woo her, <laughs> woo her back. But there's oh a moment God, when he starts screaming. Um, I, think he's, I think his dad calls up like, and is on the speakerphone, uh-huh. and he starts screaming at his father. And there was a moment where Sandler, Sandler scream, he He's so invested in it that the whites of his eyes turned black. And it like, and I could just, there was a level of anger and commitment to this performance. Yeah. I said, that is something else. That he's That's not just screaming chops. and being like, yeah. he, 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 yeah. he, he potentially is, is completely psychotic underneath all of it. And I loved it. Um, That's great. I love that. Yeah. And it was, um, you know, he has a great physical way about him. And I, um, yeah, loved working with with Adam. Do you ever have any desire to, especially now that they make so many of these sort of limited series, does that ever does that ever appeal to you? The idea of being able to tell four hundred page script over a longer, yeah. Okay, I'm. I don't know. I want to be careful what I say here because I only over in the past couple of weeks have become a little bit preoccupied with the what seems to be a real unfortunate turn of events, which is. 80 minute stories being turned into like nine part, you know, mm-hmm. things that it just seems to be the kind of the call of the day. Like, this is yeah. what we're doing. Yeah. yeah. The when in fact, you know, it's like piss off. I, I don't, this is, this is stretched out way too much, you know. Yeah. I mean, I was watching um, The Purple Rose of Cairo last night, <laughs> which is about 92 minutes. And mm-hmm. absolutely perfect, mm-hmm. and is, is packed so much story. You know, it's so interesting because people say that all the time. They're like, oh, "Did you see so and so? Did you see the new series blank or whatever?" And they're like, oh, "Yeah, I try to get it." Well, no, you got to wait nine episodes in. Yeah, yeah. just it's wait really till good. the third one. Right, right. <laughs> I know. Yeah. Fuck, Insane. piss off. Can it be good after right. the first one? Yeah. No. So I, but I only have been really feeling this lately when I'm, and I, and I don't have a leg to stand on because I haven't really. I don't. I don't want to sound like an asshole here, but I, I haven't seen much of it because my viewing always goes, like, if I have opportunity to watch TV, I fucking end up, I'm watching old movies, you know? It's just sort yeah. of like my, and the gravity pulls me that way with the time that I have in the day. But, um, you know, you know, sometimes you have a story that's very large, like a large-scale story, any kind of epic stories, and, the, and those are great. And there used to be this opportunity they would have, like, the winds of war or, you know, yeah. Roots or these, sort of these huge miniseries. Right. It was like, yeah. okay, that's fantastic. That used to be a kind of work of art in and of itself. But now I feel this kind of slow-motion turn towards the stories stretched out, um, 
too much, I think. Um, I guess underneath it, I have a fear that the, the painfully difficult challenge of telling a story in preferably under two hours, hopefully 90 minutes, will start to get lost because I think it's a very, very valuable story telling to, you know, that structure is great. Yeah. I don't want to see that get lost. Um, there is the, the, the risk that we rewiring how we appreciate those things. And I watched that, um, the story of uh, Neville Chamberlain, uh, um, you know, signing the Munich agreement with, with Hitler over the Sudetenland, et cetera, et cetera, trying to avoid war. Mm-hmm. This was just to unwind the other just night. Just to yeah. unwind. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on Tubi, I think and, it was on Tubi. And, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what was interesting was was that he was telling this really simple story that was just a snapshot of that time and of that very specific story and these two guys who tried to uh, alter the course of... And I realized halfway through, I thought, to your point, I, I was like, I'm surprised that they didn't try to stretch it out and that they'd actually mm-hmm. made this film became quite surprising to me while I was watching it. Because we've become so accustomed to, and our brains are wired to, you know, great, there's going to be 12 episodes of this now. Right. Yeah. Um, Yeah. Let's talk about the opposite, uh, trailers. Um, I think you love trailers. Yeah. Based on how incredible your trailers are, and I think you cut them yourself. I love trailers. Trailers are their own little art form, and um, I, I have cut them in the past. Or collaborated with people. Um, the last one that we did was was not cut by by me. It was cut by a guy named Joel, um, who's got a company called Aspect Ratio, and it mm-hmm. was yeah. one of those great moments where I just handed the film over and said, what, "Can you do something?" And and it was so perfect right away that we didn't say anything. We just said, "That's it," you know. It was great, <laughs> really? and that was wow. a really fun feeling. But yeah, I always um, that was one of the joys to me of going to sit in a movie theater. Um, I guess there's people, there's probably two types of people in the world, people that like to sit down and watch trailers and then people that like to watch the credits of movies, you know, um, <laughs> <laughs> people like to watch the credits and people that don't like to watch the credits. Mm-hmm. I like to watch the credits. Yeah. And, um, yeah. Um, you once described having four kids in the best way I thought possible. And I think I mentioned this when we had Maya on, um, which was, and I'll I'll mash this up. You correct me. Uh, that having four kids is like having four cozy fires burning in the house. Just hearing them run around, and and it sounds like you're as much of a homebody as I am. How do you manage to work as hard as you do and still be an incredible father to not one, not two, not three, but four kids? Well, I hope so. I mean, time will tell. Um, (laughs) yeah, this is very dangerous. I remember there's these great uh, episodes with Lucille Ball um, doing these radio interviews from the the mid-60s. I don't know if you've heard those. They were on Sirius XM for a little while. And and you hear all these people um, talking about their strengths as parents. And then you sort of realize, you know, that time has really proven quite differently that, you know, there are these people talking about, <laughs> yeah. you know, we really sp- spend time on the weekends and everything else. Uh-huh. And you're like, uh-huh, uh-huh. Okay. Stay yeah. tuned for the book. Uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But um, exactly. I don't know, you know, one of, the, one of the benefits of writing, I suppose, is, you know, the ability to work from home, the ability to be present at home. And shooting movies about the valley. <laughs> well, that helps too. Yeah. Um, to not to not go too far away, but even still, I think that it, it, you know, I don't know. I, when I went to London to make Phantom Thread, there was they did come for some of the time, but then they understood that for two months you're not going to see me, you know. But that's okay. Out of twelve twelve months in a year. As long as I'm with you the other chunk of time, you, yeah. know, you won't yeah. miss me that much. Sorry, Jason, when he says be present, it means yeah. that you are where you, you are and that you're aware of the surroundings and of other people, et cetera. Okay. <laughs> Got it. Not just okay, getting good. filled so, in. Yeah. <laughs> right. Understood. <laughs> so, so, um... Um, well, I, do, I will say I do love. I, and this is such a. This is almost, almost trite to say, but you're you're. Your affinity for your your love of telling stories about Los Angeles uh, in in so many different ways and so many different times, um, I find it fa- I find it really fascinating. You you tell stories about the experience of California, unlike anybody else, and um, because I think that there's always been that rub that California is not as interesting because it's newer, mm-hmm. um, that you know that it's not the East Coast and it's always kind of looked down on in this way. But you've tell these stories about actually how rich it is it's just different 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, and they've got the Dodgers, right, Paul? Yes, sure. they do. You know? Well, <laughs> yes, they do. Are um, you a Dodger now, guy? Yeah, I catch yeah, him up here oh, once in a while. Hey, course. so Tarantino says any great filmmaker only has ten films in them. You've made nine. Um, tell me that. Tell me that's not oh, true. Oh, that's horseshit. I don't know. I don't. I don't, <laughs> I don't understand what he's on about. About that. Okay, great. It's just like I, I need more than one more from you. Yeah, you got it. I mean, I don't you, know. I, are you gonna are you gonna do it like Clint Eastwood until until they cart you off? <clears throat> yes. I don't yeah, know. You that's have a to. Yes. I think what else are you gonna yes. do? Exactly. I, can, I think yeah. What else are you gonna do? Yeah. You have to um, because you're because I, I would imagine your perspective on stuff changes as you get older. In other words. You would have made Heart Eight differently today than you did then. Sure. No better, no worse, just differently. You haven't so made I'm one sure, bad film. Yeah, I no. want to see what your what your brain is like when you're 85. What's interesting to you and how you compose shots and all that stuff. So don't stop, please. Well, thank you. Keep thank going. you for saying that. Thanks for making really good shit, Paul. Yeah, yeah Paul, no, your batting um, average is insane. You're one of the fucking greats, man. <laughs> I've, I I always tell you that when I see you in person because I can't. There's no other. I can't dress it up. I yep. just can't dress it up, man. Mm-hmm. You have you really honored us with uh, hanging out for an yes, hour, thank Paul. You, thank Paul, you, so buddy. Much. Thank Are you. Are you very kidding? Much. Thank you, guys. Really. Please say hi to my yes. ass. I sure will. I Send sure will. Our, our love. I hope I see you guys um, in person for real soon. Um, I can I hope I can come see your Oscar Levant play, Sean. I I, I really genuinely am. <laughs> I love Oscar Levant. I would love for you to. We Are you playing? Who's playing Oscar Levant? That would be me. You're playing Oscar Levant? I'm playing Oscar Levant, yeah. Oh you should God. hear him play Rhapsody in Blue, too, on piano. You know, he's, he's a classically really? trained pianist. It's yeah. insane. Polly, thank you for being here. We love you. We Thanks love so much, Polly. Thank you, man. Are you kidding? Thanks, guys. Hopefully, we'll oh, yeah. see you out at the stadium if uh, baseball gets their act together. I, fingers crossed. They will. They will. All, All right. Great. Have a great day, man. See you, man. All right. See you, Paul. Right. Bye, Paul. Bye, buddy. <laughs> Bye, Paul. That was a good get, Jay. I love Jay. Jay, oh, my God. I mean, I've been working this for a couple of weeks with you guys saying I booked somebody that I'm excited oh, about that this you guys one. won't be excited. Yeah. I tried to I tried to kind of fake it a little bit. I can't believe oh, no, it. It's I, right? You know, it's true, though. You know, when you when you name all his movies uh, for Tracy, again, I know you said at the top of this episode, but it's Boogie Nights, Magnolia, Punch Drunk Love. Um, there Will Be Blood. There Will Be Blood. Uh, Licorice, Licorice Pizza. Pizza. Out now. And, the master. A, 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 he doesn't uh, yeah. miss. He never misses. Phantom and you know, I, never misses. And there's so many years in between him making those. Well, so you're like, oh, that's them. why it's so long because he invests everything that he is into these things. That's why, what you said, nine, right? He's only made nine. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. And they've all Amazing. been great. Yeah. yeah. He's, uh, what a, what a talent, that guy. I, I'm, I'm really, I'm just, I, I'm, I, th- I think I seem pretty casual all the way through that, but my goodness, is that guy a hero to me? Yeah, he's amazing. I yeah, like same. I, I, you know, I've known him just a little bit over the years from f- through Maya, and uh, every time, I think at every time, I'm always right on the edge at risk of embarrassing myself. <laughs> um, and I do end up saying stuff like, your, your movie was incredible and I can't get over it. <laughs> and then I have to walk away. Yeah. Most of the time, I have to walk away. I really, I, I would, l- I, 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 I'd love for him to make some big, broad comedy. I, the, the ones that I know he's a fan yeah, of. Yeah, I know. The I know. stuff that... Uh, I was going to ask him that. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure he gets that question a lot, so I'm glad yeah. to, glad none of us did because I, I wanted to ask him that too. But, like, you know, you think about his affinity for that I to ask kind of comedy. You know, <laughs> Monty Python, um, SNL. Uh, I bet it would just be stunning. But um, yeah, he used to be around SNL so much, obviously, and and uh, I used to he see must that. love it. He, but he you know, it, it. I liked our com- I liked our conversation about you know the streaming versus the 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 wide release stuff because you know the wide release movies when you go see them you have to pay for them, but when mm-hmm. they're at home they kind of feel like they're free, so you don't have to. Bye. Bye. <laughs> the, um, the race to the buy from you is so remarkable. Smart. Smartless is 100% organic and artisanally handcrafted by Bennett Barbaco, Michael Grant Terry, and Rob Armjarf. Smartless. From Wondery, the hit podcast We Crashed is now an Apple TV Plus series about WeWork. 
a company that promised a utopia but delivered a catastrophe. There's just one problem. Adam Newman, the charismatic CEO of WeWork, is spending investors' money at a reckless rate. Hosted by myself, David Brown of Business Wars, We Crashed, the director's cut is a refreshed six-part series about the meteoric rise and swift fall of WeWork, including new details about Adam's wife, Rebecca Newman, and her involvement in the company. Tune in after each Apple TV Plus episode to the We Crashed podcast for special bonus episodes hosted by Scott Galloway, one of WeWork's earliest critics, as he goes behind the scenes of the new Apple TV Plus series of the same name, starring Jared Leto and Anne Hathaway. Listen to We Crashed on Apple Podcasts, Amazon Music, or you can listen ad-free by joining Wondery Plus in Apple Podcasts or the Wondery app. 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 Or the Wondery app.